Creator of 5-Hour Energy wants to power the world's homes with bikes. The mystery man behind the popular caffeine shots plans to roll out 10,000 stationary bikes next year in India. The man in the picture has $4 billion. His name is Manoj Bhargava. He has no accent, but when he speaks, his ideas are not typically American. A lot of eyes and ears are on this man, Manoj Bhargava. Creator of the 5-Hour Energy Drink demonstrates his free electric bike by pedaling for one hour. He says a person can power a home's lights and basic appliances for an entire day. Now this is breakthrough, people. You might think this applies only to the poor in India, but let me tell you something. If you want a money-making idea, you're looking at it. Let me explain what I mean. America has a lot of land. If you live in the big city, then land is scarce. But that's not typical. When you drive out west, you find out it's all vacant land. And if you counted the number of acres in America that have buildings on it or are being used for anything other than home dwellings, you find that America is 94% vacant land. All you have to do is drive through Utah or Idaho or Montana between cities, and you will see that America is a vacant and vast wasteland. We are not using the land. We could grow fruits and vegetables on every square inch of land, but we're missing something electricity and water. When a property has electricity and water, it's very expensive, a thousand dollars an acre. And if it has no electricity or water, it's almost free, two or three hundred dollars per acre in some places. Now, if you go into a big city and you try to buy land near all the amenities, you're not going to find it for a thousand dollars an acre with water and power. But I think a lot of people consider the big city a rat race and they want to get out. They want to go rural, but there's no water or electricity and that stops them. This machine that you're looking at opens the door to freedom. This man in the picture says he can build this device for a hundred dollars. And that to me is just amazing. Because you would expect a device that will power a home for 24 hours to cost you at least $5,000. And I say, what if this could be powered with wind instead of pedaling power? 24 hours of wind might be enough to generate power for one day. If the power is used to supply LED lights with the right frequency for plants, and I'm talking about blue light in the beginning of the plant's life and red later. How do I remember that? B for blue and B for beginning. At the beginning of a plant's life, it needs blue light. And there's a specific wavelength. And so you put in LED lights, and now you have the right frequency to power that plant. The plant is going to take that light and make sugars like tomatoes and peppers, zucchini, squash, raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, whatever. And that means we can grow fruits and vegetables year-round where they are needed. We don't have to ship them a great distance. The demand for fruits and vegetables is tremendous and there is nothing that I can think of that is as constant as the demand for fruits and vegetables. Every single person on the planet needs fruits and vegetables every single day of their lives. Now, is that demand or what? And there are two plants I like more than anything, tomatoes and peppers, because I believe tomatoes can be used by every household in the world every day of every year, save only a few, because during Ramadan, people fast for a month. There might be other segregated exceptions, but in general, every person on the planet can use peppers and tomatoes every day of every year. And I'm growing both right now, and I think it's wonderful. 
My tomato plants are outside and it's late November. It's uh, mid-November. And these tomato plants are all going to be killed by frost. I have two watermelons growing outside. and They are also going to be killed by frost. But if I could keep the temperature above 32 degrees, my tomatoes and watermelons and peppers would survive. Inside a building, I can do that. Because when it's 19 degrees outside, that's the coldest that's ever gotten here, it kills everything. It kills my lemon tree. My lemon tree is full of lemons. I've got 20 lemons on the counter right now, ready to be squeezed for lemonade and for fish. And by the way, when I make lemonade, I put in a tablespoon of baking soda and it makes it a carbonated drink and it fights cancer. It kills cancer. Don't drink fruit drinks straight. Mix them with a tablespoon of baking soda and you will experience a wonderful carbonated drink. It's much tastier than the juice straight. Now this man in the picture is very interested in health. And every day we shed about 5 million red blood cells. And for this reason, you have to work to get these red blood cells out of your system. Your heart cannot do the entire job. You really have to get your legs in the air and then massage your calves and get those red blood cells to flow back to the heart so the body can dispose of them. They're dead red blood cells, and we have 5 million a day. And if you want to feel better, just put your legs on the wall for five minutes. And move your feet around so that your calf muscles are squeezing the blood in the veins, and all that dead red blood cell material will come back to the heart and be disposed of. I've been doing this for the last few days, and I feel much better. This man in the picture has a couple of devices that he wants to bring to the world, and the one that he's sitting in, electricity producer, is one of them. But another one is the machine that is connected to your heart, and it, when the heart pumps blood, it squeezes the lower body so that the blood is pumped back. In other words, it helps the heart. It gives the heart a little bit of a break. And what he discovered was when you give the heart the break and you increase circulation with this apparatus that is strapped around your legs and it squeezes the blood back to the heart, he found that it's effective in curing 70 to 80 percent of all diseases we have. It gives the body the strength to fight and it knows how to fight. It just doesn't have the energy to fight. And so this is an important man. I'm going to say his name again, Manoj Bhargava. I think he's from Michigan, and he feels it's his duty to help the poor because he has $4 billion. He has a water distiller that's the size of a car, and it can produce 1,000 gallons of distilled water per hour. He takes in seawater, and he puts out distilled water. And he wants to put a thousand of these on a barge or a big ship and produce water at sea and bring it to shore. And I think it would be very easy to put in a pipeline. And all he has to do is pump the water up 500 feet and it will go to shore and it will supply every piece of ground that's 500 feet above sea level or less. You know what I'm saying? The water will rise to its own level. If at sea, he's 500 feet above the sea, that water flows into the pipe and it comes up to 500 feet above sea level. And that means it can be pumped anywhere on shore because most of the land is less than 500 feet above sea level. In fact, the entire state of Florida is below 500 feet. I checked on Google and I couldn't find a parcel of land in Florida. The entire state, even up near Tallahassee, couldn't find a single parcel of ground that was higher than 150 feet above sea level. And since most people live within 100 miles of the coast, 
500 feet above sea level is going to reach many, many of the world's people. And this man wants to put a barge at sea and either ship the water in, which I think is crazy. You put in a pipeline and you pour the water or pump the water up 500 feet and it flows into the pipe and then it flows to shore automatically. And if you use solar power to pump the water, then the tanks could fill up and only be pumped when there's sunshine. And so his cost of pumping the water is the cost of the solar panels amortized over the lifetime of those panels, which I think is very cheap. But this is a very sensible man, and what you should do is type in his name, M-A-N-O-J, last name B-H-A-R-G-A-V-A, -A -A, Manoj Bargava. And watch all of his videos. He's a very sensible man. He has solutions for the world's biggest problems. I'm going to read you this article now. It's in National Geographic by Wendy Koch, and it was published October 6, 2015. Today is Tuesday, November 10, 2015. This article is one month and four days old. The man who created the five-hour energy drink says he has more money than he needs, about $4 billion more. So he's giving it away, spending his fortune on a quest to fix the world's biggest problems, including energy, and I will add water. Those are the two biggest problems we have, energy and water. Manoj Bhargava has built a stationary bike to power the millions of homes worldwide that have little or zero electricity. Early next year in India, he plans to distribute 10,000 of his free electric battery-equipped bikes, which he says will keep lights and basic appliances going for an entire day with one hour of pedaling. What if you have four members of the household who need exercise? What if you have wind outside? Can you pedal for half an hour and let the wind provide the other half hour of need? What if you had two or three of these bicycles? Could you charge up batteries and run them for a few days? I have a lot of questions. You probably do too. Bargava, who dropped out of Princeton University after a year because he was bored and then lived in ashrams in his native India for 12 years, doesn't stop at bikes. He's working on ways to make salt water drinkable, enhance the circulation in the body, and secure limitless amounts of clean geothermal energy via graphene cord. Well, I, I'm surprised that they mentioned these other things. I forgot to tell you about his geothermal idea. This is a wonderful idea. I collect information, and I collect images. And I was once interested in geothermal, and so I collected all the hot spots. I found a KML program, and if you are not familiar with keyhole markup language, it's very much like HTML. I can write code in HTML and KML, and I have written many programs. For example, I'm interested in being an event promoter, and so I wanted to know all the venues and all their seating capacities, and so I wrote a program to plot them on Google Earth. Keyhole Markup Language was purchased by Google Earth from the creator of the program. And what it does is it allows you to plot things on a three-dimensional planet Earth. So if I want to know all of the Las Vegas venues and their seating capacity, I find the list. It has the addresses of the places and their seating capacity in separate fields. And I import that into the database. I write the code and then import the data. And when I open that KML file, I save it as a KML file. When I open that KML file, it plots all the points. And so I put a cursor over a particular place in Las Vegas, and I get the seating capacity, the name of the place, the telephone number, the address, all the information. And I find it very handy. And so I have this KML program that shows me all the hot spots where the plates are moving and they create heat from the friction. And that makes the earth very hot in places. And sometimes those places are very close to the surface. If you go to Hawaii, there are places you can go where the earth is so hot that it's like infrared on your face and it hurts and you have to move back. And if you get too close, it will burn you because that earth is 2,000 degrees or so. And your face is not accustomed to 2,000 degrees. But what if we could tap that energy? You know, that energy is happening no matter what. 
The plates are going to crush together no matter what you do. And those plates cause volcanoes. They cause earthquakes. When the plates shift quickly and a lot of mass is moved, it's an earthquake. And the more mass that's moved, the higher the magnitude of that earthquake. And all the planets are pulling on the Earth, especially when one comes by as a rogue planet. Planet X comes by and suddenly all the plates are in motion and there are volcanoes all over the place and there are earthquakes with magnitude 9 occurring. And so we're never going to see the end of plates shifting and this energy being produced by the crushing of the plates and the friction. Now, what is friction? I don't know. I tried to understand it and I don't understand it. What is it that creates heat from two plates rubbing together? A lot of people will say friction. You rub your hands together, they get hot. Why do they get hot? That's what I want to know. I never could understand why, and I never heard of a scientist who understands why your hands get hot when you rub them together. What is the nature of friction? Are atoms being too close together causing heat? How does that work? There was a great scientist who served in World War II. His name is Peter Davey, D-A-V-E-Y, and he figured out something from flying the planes. Every time the propeller reached a certain speed, he would feel heat in the cockpit. And he knew that that propeller had found the right frequency, its resonance frequency, to create heat from the water in the air. And he'd get this burst of heat. And so he knew that he could find that same frequency. And so he, when he got home after the war, he lived in Christchurch, New Zealand. And his name is Scottish, I believe. Peter Daish Davy. And when he got home, he played the saxophone and he noticed that the dishes rattle with one note and the silverware rattle with a different note. And so he was a student of science, even though nobody would consider him a scientist. He was a great scientist. And so he took his understanding of the Spitfire heat in the cockpit and the saxophone rattling the silverware at one note and the dishes with another note, and he realized there's a resonant frequency for everything. And he used this to boil water with very little energy. What does that mean? Very little energy. Does that sound like a gold mine? It is. Let me tell you what we could do with that. We could boil water in a car using the car's battery. And we could drive all over town for a couple of pennies in electricity. And while we're driving, we can recharge the battery. He was getting 20 times the energy out that he put in because he understood the resonance frequency that heated water with very little vibration. He knew the frequency that was required. In America, we're on 60 hertz, and in New Zealand, they're on 50 hertz. And that's an important difference. Because he needed New Zealand's hertz. I, I don't know what to call it. I'll just call it hertz. He needed New Zealand's power set up instead of America's. And he had it. And so he was able to build this device from a bicycle bell. It was like a spherical bell, and he either cut it in half or it came that way naturally. And he connected electricity to it, and it would vibrate. And he would put it in his water for tea, and it would boil instantly. Now, if you can go to your car and use your car's battery to boil water instantly, you've got steam. What are you going to do with the steam? You're going to use it to push the car. And what are you going to do when the car is pushed? You're going to recharge the battery because you used a little bit of electricity to get the water boiling. Now you've got your power back and then some, and you use the additional power to drive all over town for free. You only need to carry a quart of water on board, and it will be recycled. It will also provide heat for the car when it's cold outside, and it might be enough power to power an air conditioner. I don't know. Because for 60 years, Peter Davy tried to get this device approved, and nobody would approve it. And so he died. 
His son is in the furniture business and has no interest whatsoever in his father's device because for 60 years the son watched his father trying to get this thing approved and saw the disappointment and doesn't want to go through it. There's someone who met him in 1990, Peter Davy Sr. His son is, has the same name, Peter Davy. And that man's name is Dr. Jan Pajak, P-A-J-A-K, who's a prolific writer and has written extensively about this. And the first name J-A-N, last name P-A-J-A-K. He's originally from Poland, writes in Polish and English, and he lives north of Christ Church. Christ Church is on the southern island, and Dr. Jan Pajak lives on the northern island. And Dr. Pajak is an engineer. And he became a close friend of Peter Davy. And there was time travel involved. And I'm not going to go into any more detail because this is not about Peter Davy. I just wanted to inform you enough so that you could begin your own research. I want to go back to the article I'm reading. And I'll make one last statement. There are free energy devices out there. Not just one, but thousands of them. And they have all been made illegal by those who want total control over energy. And this is a crime against humanity, and I think it should end. This man, Manoj Bargawa, is one person who can end it. But he will probably be killed in the process. Because those who control energy will kill anyone in order to continue their racket. And I consider it a racket because they're criminals. They're holding us back for their own selfish purposes. And instead of all of us being rich from free energy, free energy is like gold coming out of the ground for free. And everyone on the planet can be a billionaire. But this handful of people want to hold us back so that they remain relatively richer than us. And I think this is wrong. And I stand vehemently opposed to it. And that's why I make videos. Until we get the free energy devices and can draw energy from the vacuum, zero-point energy, let me explain it very briefly. If you remove everything from space, you still have energy. In one cubic centimeter, you have enough energy that if it was converted into mass, it would be more mass than all of the universe, all of the galaxies that we can see with the strongest telescopes. That's how much energy there is in one cubic centimeter of space. And I'm talking about vacuum space. That's all I want to say about zero-point energy. You can read Jane's Defense Weekly, especially Nick Cook, because he was hotly in pursuit of it. I read it. I think it's good reading. You can read about eyewitnesses who worked at the patent office and are familiar with all of the devices that have been outlawed or stamped top secret. And the inventors were told to keep quiet. Some of them were killed. You can listen to Dr. Stephen Greer talk about the same subject. And Dr. Stephen Greer wants to meet someone like Manaj Bhargava. And he wants the billionaire to bring free energy to everyone. We are going to have free energy soon. But in the meantime, we can tap geothermal energy because it is practically unlimited. And there are certain places on the planet where it is abundant. And these are places where there aren't any people very often. It's not a good idea to live near ground that's 2,000 degrees on the surface. But if you go down 10 feet in some places like California, you've got hot spots. You go down 10 feet and the earth is 300 degrees. And if water is nearby, that water is 300 degrees. And so I collected all of the places where water is hot naturally because this can heat your home. If you're making energy from boiling the water and you start with water that's 180 degrees, it only has to go up to 212 Fahrenheit in order to boil. So you add very little energy. You might be able to heat it with the sun. Now you've got free energy from geothermal. Well, the device that Manaj Bhargava is interested in transfers the heat from down below to the surface using graphene cord. And why is graphene important? Because at one end, that's the deep end, you've got heat. The graphene is very hot there because it's touching the source of heat. But graphene conducts heat and electricity extremely well. And it transfers that heat to the surface where you're heating your home or you're running a dry cleaners or something like that. 
And so you're using the energy from the earth. And what about the graphene cord? Is it hot all the way? No, it's cold in the middle and hot at both ends because it's so good at conducting heat. It's a hundred times more efficient in conducting electricity than copper. So graphene is a very important material for the future. Let's go to the next card. Quote, if you have wealth, it's a duty to help those who don't. Unquote. Says Michigan resident Bargava, 62 years old in 2015, in a documentary released Monday, Billions in Change, about his Stage 2 Innovations Lab. Quote, make a difference in people's lives, unquote, he says. Quote, don't just talk about it, unquote. That sums up the philosophy of this great, great man. Next card. Could his bicycle really work? Will people want to pedal for an hour? Could they afford it or even have room for it in their homes? It holds huge potential and opportunity for rural households, says Ajaita Shah, CEO of Frontier Markets, a company selling solar lamps and lighting kits in India. Read about her work. She says she'd like to test the bike with her rural customers. Now, if it costs $100 to build, what is he going to sell it for? If he wants to sell an infinite number of them, then he has to make a small profit. What is a small profit? I suppose $200 would give him a small profit. If his costs are $100, you've got distribution, advertising, and so on. You have a lot of costs in business. He might have to sell it for $200 to make a small profit of $20, I would say. If he can make a profit of $20 by selling these, then he can sell an infinite number of them. It won't make him any poorer. If you're going to give away your money, it helps if you have an infinite amount of it. And by making $20, he has an infinite amount of money, not just $4 billion. And you might ask, why didn't Donald Trump think of this? And I would say, one, Donald Trump is not interested in other people. He's interested in himself. Two, he's not smart enough. Manaj Bhargava is very smart. He's so smart that he's dedicated to service to others. I think Donald Trump is service to self. Would I vote for him? No. Next card. This is a quote. It's so simple that we think we can make it for $100. A bicycle repairman anywhere can fix it, unquote, Bargava says in an interview. Pedaling turns a turbine generator that creates electricity stored in a battery. They don't tell us what type of battery. If it's a lithium battery, I don't have much confidence in the lithium battery. Every lithium battery I ever bought was dead in no time and I couldn't recharge it. I think the battery is seriously flawed. But if he has a battery that can be completely discharged and recharged completely, I'd like to know more about the battery. The author says the first 50 bikes will be tested in 15 or 20 small villages in the northern state of Uttarakhand. I don't know if that's the state where New Delhi is, but when you say northern India, I think of Punjab and New Delhi. Uttarakhand, before a major rollout in the first quarter of next year. He says they'll be made in India, but doesn't give details. Now we have a promotional image of the device. It looks very simple. I'm amazed by the simplicity of it. I have always loved the idea of a flywheel. Because once you get a flywheel moving, if it's a heavy flywheel, it will continue moving for a long time and produce a lot of energy. And it doesn't take that much energy to get the flywheel going in the first place. From the image on your screen, you can tell that this is a video. And so if you go to the website, the URL will be provided to you in the video description. You can watch this video. I have probably already seen it because I've watched a lot of videos regarding Manoj Bhargava. Who is he? Bhargava is a bit of a mystery man. He grew up in an affluent home with servants in India, but his family struggled financially after coming to the United States when he was 14. He worked odd jobs and got academic scholarships. Ah, so he was very bright to start with. And then there's a quote. 
It was worth a year, unquote, he says, of studying math at Princeton. After a spiritual quest in India, he built companies including Living Essentials, maker of the popular two-ounce caffeine shot that's sold at checkout counters. Why would anyone drink a caffeine shot? This is not what healthy people want. I'm quite surprised. I think it's a dangerous product as well. Though generally low profile, he's not without controversy. He sued to fend off copycats of his blockbuster product and countered challenges from state attorneys general for alleged deceptive marketing. The Center for Public Integrity dubbed him the, quote, political kingmaker nobody knows, unquote. Says he's donated millions to mostly GOP political candidates via limited liability companies. Well, I don't like that at all. I would never give any money to any Democrat or Republican candidate. I want to end the representative system. I think it is seriously flawed. If the Constitution has a major flaw, it is representative government. And here's why. Nobody will ever spend your money as wisely as you will. Because it's not their money. It's exactly like having someone sit at the poker table and play with your cards and your chips. They will be going for inside straights in no time and blowing huge amounts of money. We need to end this very destructive and corrupt system of representative government. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Next paragraph. Also unknown exactly how much money he has. The documentary says he has a net worth of $4 billion, but Forbes does not list him among America's richest 400 people, which includes those with at least $1.7 billion. Who gives a shit what Forbes says? There are people with trillions of dollars, and they never show up on the Forbes list. It is a bullshit propaganda list to start with. I rest my case. Bargawa has said it's difficult to put a specific valuation on his private companies, but he's signed the giving pledge, a Bill Gates-led challenge for the rich to donate their fortunes to charitable causes. Mentioning Bill Gates in this article, I think, is blasphemy. Bill Gates is a son of a bitch. He crushed the lives of many productive people during his tyranny at Microsoft. And I will never forgive or forget. And every chance I have to bring it out in the open, I will. He broke federal law and did not go to prison. If you break federal law, your ass is in jail in no time. Janet Reno fined him a million dollars a day, and he was making $34 million a day, and he basically flipped the middle finger up at Janet Reno. It was extremely profitable to break federal law. He is above the fucking law, and this is bullshit. And we must never forget that Bill Gates is a criminal who broke federal law and got away with it. He was never fucking handcuffed, never put into the back of a squad car, and he spent no time in prison or even a dirty jail cell. But when people went to Zuccotti Park to protest the theft of trillions of dollars, they were beaten with batons and pepper sprayed arrested and put into a filthy jail cell, and this is no way to treat citizens of the United States of America. This is supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave, and people like Bill Gates escaped justice because he had so much fucking money, and that's bullshit. Whenever I see his name, I'm stirred up again. Let's go back to the article. All right, so he's got $4 billion, but Forbes doesn't recognize him. Who gives a shit? Forbes never reports on the people who have the real big money. You never read about the trillionaires, and there are a lot of them, and they're draining us every day. Manaj Bhargava does not want to ruin his son's life by giving him $4 billion. He says he didn't want to ruin his son by giving him money. I told him when he was 10, you're not getting anything. His attitude, great, I want to do it on my own. Bargava says about his now adult son. 
Instead, Bhargava has funded hospitals in India and his cutting-edge Stage 2 lab in Farmington Hills, Michigan, begun in 2011 with former Chrysler CEO Tom Lasorda. Quote, it's the most well-funded playhouse for engineers you can possibly have, unquote. Lab engineer Kevin Moran says in the documentary, I saw that clip and I thought Kevin was an inventor. Now I see that he is a lab engineer. Bhargava says this is going to affect a few billion people. Big problems, simple fixes. Bhargava's team has come up with innovative ideas in health, water, and energy. And that's what we need. That's exactly what we need. We need to solve the problems of tomorrow, and Bhargava has a key role. Isn't he a wonderful man? It depends on how close he is to Bill Gates. It's pursuing Renew, a medical device that functions as an auxiliary heart by squeezing blood from the legs into the body's core. Well, as soon as I saw that device, I liked it. And if you can't afford the device, it probably costs several hundred dollars, lay on your bed and put your feet on the wall, but put on some socks so you don't mark up the wall. Get your legs elevated. You know, a lot of people ridicule the guy who puts his feet up on the desk, but what is he really doing? He's helping his heart. He's letting the blood flow back to the heart using gravity. It's not that bad. If you're a boss and you walk in and your employee has his feet up on the desk and he's talking on the phone, don't ridicule him. This man will live longer. I don't think you need an auxiliary heart to squeeze the blood from your legs. You can put your feet on the wall and squeeze your own calves and bring that blood back to the heart. The blood contains a lot of dead blood cells. You want to eradicate them from your body. I have been doing this for the last few days and I feel great. I'm trying to recover from fluoridated water. I am now buying distilled water. I figured out it would cost me about $150 to $200 a year to drink distilled water. And I started and the fluoridated water has permanently changed my body chemistry. I can tell by the smell of the urine. My body has changed. I think it damaged my body. I don't know if I can recover even if I drink a thousand gallons of distilled water. It is a terrible crime against the people to put rat poison fluoride in their drinking water. If you don't know much about chemistry, fluoride is like a neodymium magnet. Now imagine your body functions are represented with paper clips on the table and everything is working well. Then a neodymium magnet comes along and screws up everything. All of the paper clips on the table are attracted to this magnet. That's what fluoride is. It's a very powerful magnet and it disrupts every body process. And people die of cancer. They don't even know it's related to fluoride. We should not put fluoride in the drinking water. There is no body function that needs fluoride. It is detrimental to your health, and we must get this message out to the people. Now, if anybody is a proponent to fluoridation of water, I want to put a glass of water in front of them and put a tablespoon of rat poison in the drinking water and tell them to drink it to prove that fluoride has no effect. Drink the goddamn water, and let's see if you make it through tomorrow. Because it's rat poison, and it will kill you. Don't give me bullshit. Vitamins are also good for us. Why don't the motherfuckers put vitamins in our drinking water? Why don't we shower with vitamins and flush them down the toilet like we do with fluoride? They're telling us that fluoride is good for us, and they want us to shower with it and flush our toilets with it and water our lawns with fluoride. What for? Why do we need fluoride in the environment? Because they don't want to pay to get rid of it. That's why. They want to dump their industrial waste into our drinking water, and I don't think it's appropriate. We need some lawsuits against any doctor who advocates fluoridation of the water. We need to sue the cities. We need to sue everyone who is conspiring to get fluoride in your drinking water. Most of these people are paid off. We need to take the fucking profit out of their bribes by suing them in class action lawsuits.
Okay, so they just talked about an auxiliary heart pumping blood back to the body's core. You don't need this device. You put your feet on the wall, you squeeze your calves, and I promise you, you'll feel better. Move your legs like you're pedaling a bicycle. Move your feet forward and backward like you're pedaling. And move those calf muscles. You'll pull all these dead blood cells back to the heart. Okay, let's move on. He has a wonderful device which produces a thousand gallons of water an hour. This is just amazing technology. It's the size of an automobile and it produces a thousand gallons of distilled water per hour. To address drought, it's building the rainmaker to convert 1,000 gallons an hour of any kind of water into drinkable water. Bargawa says potable water can be piped from offshore barges with this machine now being tested at a desalination research facility in New Mexico. Well, New Mexico is not on the ocean, and I'm wondering what they're doing. You know, if we could have free energy, we could separate water into its constituent elements of hydrogen and oxygen, and when they are recombined, they will produce the purest water we have ever seen. I mean really pure water. Ignite hydrogen and oxygen and it will return back to water and it will occupy about one eighteen hundredth as much space. That means you're creating a vacuum, basically. If you had a cylinder and it had gas in it, let's say hydrogen and oxygen, and you ignited it, the gas would return to water and occupy 1 over 1,800 times as much space. And inside that cylinder, you would have a tremendous vacuum. What can you use a vacuum for? You can use it to drive a car. A vacuum will pull a piston. You can use it to pump water. Remember we were talking about these barges at sea with desalination machines? And we were talking about pumping the water up 500 feet. You can use the ignition of water and the vacuum created to pull that water up so that it flows into the pipe that carries the water to the city. Let's go to the next card. He has an even grander idea, one aimed at nixing the world's reliance on fossil fuels. Well, that'll get him killed, which emit greenhouse gases when burned. Whatever people think of climate change, he says in the documentary, pollution is a problem. His answer, tap the heat from deep beneath the earth. Well, we have been sold on greenhouse gases and it's all bullshit because methane gas is 11 times worse. Al Gore went all over the country saying that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere heats up the atmosphere and it's total bullshit. We have seen a one degree variation in the Earth's atmosphere, and that is in the normal range of variation. There were times in our history when we had a lot more carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a plant nutrient. It is used to make sugars, and Al Gore is full of shit. They closed the discussion without even having one, and Al Gore is a fucking liar. He suddenly had $100 million. Where did it come from? Putting out propaganda. Bullshit. He's a fucking whore. That's who Al Gore is. How dare them close the discussion before it's even held? The scientists of the world have a right to weigh in on this global warming bullshit. If there is more carbon dioxide in the air, then plants find it easier to make sugars. Period. End of story. There isn't any greenhouse effect. It's all bullshit. At the landfills, you find everything there turning into methane gas. Everything breaks down into methane gas. It hasn't destroyed the planet. Methane gas is terrible, and it hasn't destroyed the planet. It has not caused any greenhouse effect. Read into this, and you'll see that carbon dioxide is minor. Methane is major, 11 times worse than carbon dioxide. Al Gore is full of shit. They were trying to pass a world tax. 
Al Gore bought into the company that was going to make a killing from taxing the whole fucking world. We have enough fucking taxes. We don't need any more fucking taxes. What we need are fewer Al Gores and fewer propaganda stations. Less bullshit in the world. We need to take the power away from those who have it because they don't know how to use it. They use it against us instead of trying to help the people. Too much power concentrated into the hands of evil people. I love the idea of using the heat in the earth because it's there and it's free and we might as well use it. There are many places on earth where this heat comes almost to the surface. Now, if you know anything about the earth, you know the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. When you go about five kilometers down, it's 5,000 degrees, as I recall. In the ocean, the deeper you go, the colder it gets. The average temperature of all of the water in the ocean is about one degrees above freezing. It is very rare that you find water that's 80 degrees like you do in the Bahamas. It's a very shallow sea, and between the Bahamas and Cuba, you've got thousands and thousands of acres of land that are only in 10 feet of water. It would be a great place to build timeshares. You'd have an ocean view from every room in the hotel. Actually, it's a timeshare facility. And it would be tremendously profitable. Even at $15,000 per unit, you could give 1,000 square feet for $15,000 per week. You own it for one week a year for $15,000. You sell 50 of those and you retain two for cleaning and maintenance. Next paragraph. While geothermal energy is already widely used in some countries, including Indonesia and Iceland, Borgawa takes a novel approach. Rather than using steam mixed with chemicals to bring the heat to the surface, he would instead put it up a graphene cord. Now remember what I said earlier. The reason this is a significant improvement is because at one end of the graphene cord you have heat, that's the heat from the earth, and at the other end of the graphene cord you have heat, and the middle is cold. That's very important. Graphene conducts heat and electricity extremely well. He notes graphene stronger than steel is an incredible conductor of heat. Quote, you don't need to burn anything. Once you bring heat up, you don't change any of the infrastructure, he says, explaining that utilities could simply distribute it instead of coal, oil, or natural gas. I'm 100% in favor of that. Imagine places on the planet where the weather is basically cold year-round, like Alaska. If you had heat beneath the surface, you could bring that heat up, put the entire city under glass, and have one hell of a tropical paradise inside that dome. We've built large domes already. We know how to do it. But we don't really need the land in the north because we have so much land in the temperate zone. There are only about 50 people per square kilometer on the planet. The average density of the population is 50 people per kilometer. That is not overcrowded. We haven't even touched the sea. Three quarters of the planet is sea. We could live at sea. There are oil platforms all over the place and they're abandoned. We could build on those if we wanted to. Have cities that grow their own fruits and vegetables in the Gulf of Mexico. It's very warm there. Imagine being south of Florida, south of Texas. It's warm. And once you build one, you can build four or five right next to them and connect them all together. It's more stable. But we don't need to go to the sea. We have plenty of land. America is 94% vacant land. I say get your bicycle, make electricity, and turn land that's useless into land that's valuable. If we can figure out how to pull the water out of the air, then you've got water and electricity. You can be thousands of miles from civilization and still have electricity and water. What are we waiting for? In the atmosphere, there is, at any given time, 31 cubic miles of water. Imagine that. 31 cubic miles of water in the air at any given time. And you know what happens if you took all of that water out of the air and put it in a tank or used it to flush toilets and take showers? If you took all that water out of the air, you know what would happen the next day? 
You may not believe this, but dry air is heavier than air that has picked up water because the air that picks up water is larger. It's a larger molecule, and therefore it weighs less per cubic centimeter. And so it rises. And so dry air goes down to the sea, picks up water, and then rises. And when it blows over mountains and is pushed up and cooled, it lets go of the water because the amount of water that air can hold depends on the temperature. The hotter, the more water the air can hold. And so when warm, moist air is blown against a mountain and rises up, it cools and it rains. You have precipitation. If it's cold enough, you have snow. But that's how we get fresh water. The dry air molecules pick it up from the sea and they're moist and warm and they're blown over the land and they rise up, they cool, and they drop the water out of the air. Water condenses out in the form of precipitation, and that's how we get lakes and rivers and fresh water on land. Now, what if we could pull water right out of the air and use it to take showers and flush toilets and water the lawn, and the only thing I want to drink is distilled water? I don't want to drink water from the air because they're spraying biological weapons in the air on us every day. And I'll name three. Strontium. Barium, which weakens the immune system. It's nano-sized. They also spray us with nano-sized aluminum oxide, which causes Alzheimer's disease. What I think they are doing is they're killing the old people so they don't have to pay them Medicare and Social Security. There is no reason for them to spray us with barium, which weakens the immune system, strontium, which I don't know what it does. I haven't even read about it because I was disturbed enough when I read about nano-sized aluminum oxide. There is an expert on this. He's a neurosurgeon. His name is Dr. Russell Blaylock, and he has videos on YouTube. And if you hear him speak about this topic, you will be appalled that our government would spray us with something so deadly. It's not right. I believe they're using airplanes to spray us with industrial waste because it's cheaper to get rid of them by spraying them on us than it is to dispose of them in the proper way. And I think no government should do this to the people. There are many issues that I want known. And I have advocated that people provide a link to 10 others. And everybody should be on the same page so that we know what they're doing to us. This is a chemical and biological warfare. It's illegal and it must end. If you take some time to think about it, this next paragraph is quite amazing. He says, that's going to be, in my mind, the final answer. Estimating this type of geothermal could replace 85% of today's fossil fuels. If that isn't an overthrow of power, I don't know what would be. We could bring the oil companies to their knees and make them sell that stuff for a reasonable price. 85% replacement of fossil fuels. Now, remember, this graphene is hot at both ends. It's cold in the middle. What does that mean? It means you pick up the heat, you transfer the heat to another place, and it doesn't lose any heat on the way. That's what I'm reading into this. Suppose you have a place in the desert 20 miles from any town, and just below the surface, you have 500 degrees temperature. What can you do with this? Well, you tap in your graphene at one end, the heat source, and you can route it 20 miles away to homes that can use this heat. Now, they don't need 500 degrees. What they need is enough heat to heat the house in the winter. It might be a business also that uses heat to dry clothes, like a laundromat or a dry cleaners. Or it might be a plant that has to heat up water to boiling. Well, 500 degrees is way beyond boiling, and so you have abundant heat to boil the water. Now, what is the cost? Once the cable is put in, the graphene cable, and it's run 20 miles, the heat is transferred 20 miles and it can boil water far away from the source of the heat. I think that's amazing. 
You don't have to pump any oil out of the ground. You don't have to do any fracking to destroy the drinking water of the people in the area. There is no sulfur escaping into the atmosphere. Now, here's the surprising part. He says maps show half of the world has plentiful underground heat. And since graphene cables could run horizontally, they could route the heat to the other half as well. So Iceland is exporting heat to other countries. Imagine that. And it isn't hurting Iceland to get rid of this heat because the heat causes some problems. The heat is generated by plates crushing together. And if you can dissipate that heat and use it in a meaningful way, you benefit all the people who receive it. Let's go to the next card. Now he says something cautionary. I think someone's going to kill me, he says with a laugh. He's not joking. He's serious. Noting how such an idea could upset geopolitics. He's working with a graphene research center in Singapore to develop a cable and plans to have pictures available later this year. Well, right now it's a dream. He's taking the properties of graphene, he's applying them usefully, and he's coming up with something disruptive, and that's why he's a billionaire. I hate when people say they want to give something back, like they stole something and they need to return it. He says, it's not giving back, it's what else am I going to do? He doesn't feel any obligation to give something back. He made the money honestly. Some people disagree with that, by the way. They accused him of deceptive advertising. He's selling basically a caffeine high with his little drink. I heard him talk about it, and he never mentioned caffeine. But when I read the criticisms about him, there was caffeine. And so I understood the controversy. I'm not concerned because he could abandon that drink and just work on his graphene thing and get killed that way. Now we're going to talk about the bike that produces electricity. There are a lot of questions I have about this bike because I want one. He says he can build it for $100. You pedal for one hour, you have electricity for 24 hours. I'm interested in it for real estate purposes because I know how much more valuable land is if it has water and power. If you have electricity, you can pull water out of the air. Even in the driest place on the planet, you can still pull water out of the air. You just need energy. If you can provide that energy by exercising, this is the best of two worlds. The only thing I would do with this bicycle is have the legs above the heart. If you're lying down pedaling, like you're lying down on a soft bed or a cushioned mat, and your legs are above your head, this will allow all the blood to flow by gravity back to the heart. It gives your heart a break. Meanwhile, your heart is pumping to pedal, and so it's a little bit easier on your heart. There's no reason to tear up the heart muscles by pedaling in an upright position. We don't need to be in an upright position. Horizontal is best because then you're not going to cause strokes in the old people. We don't want old people to have a stroke. We want them to have electricity. And this wonderful invention that he can produce for $100 and sell to the public for maybe $500 or less. If you have power in your home for $500 and all you have to do is pedal for an hour, you put your kids to work. They're not going to have a stroke. Tell them they don't get any oatmeal until they pedal for an hour. Make them get up an hour early. They go to school, they're already tired out. Maybe they'll pay attention in class instead of goofing off. The next section is entitled, The Bike Ridden Round the World. Borgawa gets most animated when talking about his graphene cable, but he sees the most immediate potential in free electricity. Now, don't forget, I want this bicycle powered by wind, in addition to a little pedal now and then. He says it could provide electricity for the developing world and offer post-storm backup power in wealthier countries. Notice how he dodges replacing the grid because that grid is owned by greedy people. And they don't want him to come along with a bicycle you pedal for an hour and you've got electricity for a whole day. I think we should put dogs inside of a squirrel cage 
and have them run producing electricity. That allows the dog to earn his dog food. The next card is an image. It shows the readout. It shows how fully charged the battery is. In this case, it is 48% charged and charging. I can't read the rest of it. 17 hours, 16 minutes. Apparently, when you start to play back this stored electricity, you must have 17 hours worth. Well, if 48% equals 17 hours and 16 minutes, what is 100%? It would have to be 34 hours. That is amazing. Then it has 4 hours, 19 minutes. I don't know what that is. Then it says something about browsing over Wi-Fi, 4 hours, 19 minutes. Oh, video playback. Number two is video playback. So if you're watching videos, you have four hours worth. The first one says audio playback. So that's 17 hours of audio playback. Well, I'll tell you something. Audio and video playback are no big deal. I want to run a microwave. I want to run the heater. I want to run the air conditioner. How much time do I have after an hour of pedaling? Five minutes? The biggest drains in the household are the dryer, if it's an electric dryer, the refrigerator, and the air conditioner. The microwave oven also, those are the four big draws on your power. I want to know how long I can run a refrigerator and an electric dryer. I want to know if I can air condition the house. It gets 125 degrees where I live. Every animal in the desert is trying to find shade and they suffer. They really suffer out there in the heat. I have a bird bath. The birds come in and they bathe to cool off. The squirrel comes over and he lays in the bird's bath on his belly and he holds onto the sides. When I come out, he quickly jumps out of the hot tub and runs away all wet but he's cooled off. The gopher jumps into the drinking water I put out for the rabbits, and he cools off in that way. I think it's pretty fascinating to see the birds come in and get into a shallow bath and splash. I have a deep pond for drinking, and they like to bathe in there, so I set up a shallow pond just for bathing. So they come along, the water's warm, they get in there and splash all around, and I've got a jug that automatically refills it. Let's read the caption below this image. The stationary free electric bike has a battery to store electricity generated when the rider is pedaling. Its monitor shows how much the battery is charged. Well, using this for computer things is not much of a draw of power. We need to know more about this bicycle. It is probably not going to replace your grid anytime soon. If you had four of these in the house and everybody in the family, a family of four, was pedaling their butt off for an hour, it might make them healthier. It might provide them with some of the power they need, but I can't see storing much electricity with this device. I want to know more. Those are my questions. How long can I run an air conditioner in June and July when it's 120 degrees outside? If all you need are lights, the device has a place in the world. If he can build it for $100 and he's not interested in making a lot of money, he just wants to break even with a little bit of profit so he can keep on producing them, maybe he would sell it for $200. Can someone who earns a dollar a day or $2 a day afford electricity so they can have lights? Well, if they have lights, it opens up possibilities for other ventures. They might be able to make money because they have electricity, and they might boost that to $5 a day. So they have $3 a day to make payments. They have $3 extra every day to make payments. Eventually, they're going to pay off $200. It would only take about 70, 75 days to pay the thing off. And then from that point on, they own it, and their $3 a day is a bonus. So I like the idea, I just need to know more. There's a quote, this is going to affect a billion people, unquote, he says, noting the main challenge will be distribution, a subject he knows well. He won't give the bike away because he says people won't take care of something that's free. Rather, he'd prefer to incentivize distributors with profits. He says a village can also pool its resources, buying one bike but multiple batteries that can be swapped out 
to power individual homes. So here's how it works. The community buys it for $3 a day payments for maybe three months. And everybody comes with their battery and they pedal for an hour. They take their charged battery home. They've got lights for the next 24 hours. This is a wonderful idea. It doesn't rob the oil companies of their greedy profits. And so I find it fascinating. Those working in rural India welcome the idea. Quote, the problem of universal energy access is so big and diverse that we need multiple innovations to solve it. Free electric appears to be one such product innovation, unquote, says Payush Mathur, chief financial officer of Simpa Networks, a company that offers pay-as-you-go financing for its solar lighting. We have wind here, and every time it's windy, I think about all the energy that I'm losing. I would like to have that wind turning a propeller and generating something I can use. The equipment would not be that expensive, and I designed something where wind blows into it from any direction. The wind is concentrated. You take an area, let's say it's 10 square feet, and you reduce it to one square feet, which increases the wind speed. And as the wind speed increases, the power you get increases with the cube of the change in wind speed. So if you go from two to four, let's say two miles per hour to four miles per hour, that's a doubling. Now cube it, it's eight times as much power. I find that pretty fascinating. I have designed a lot of windmills some that fit on the top of a car. And when you're going 50 miles an hour, you have this ram air turning props inside a, something that's mounted on the top of your car. And you get enough electricity that you don't need gasoline anymore. That 50 mile an hour winds channeled into half the space is a 100 mile an hour wind. And the amount of power you get could create electricity and drive the car forward. Now we have some people who doubt he says, others doubt the appeal of off-grid solutions. Quote, the poor want grid-based power like urban households that can run TV sets at the flick of a switch, unquote, says Lydia Powell, senior fellow and energy expert at the New Delhi-based Observer Research Foundation. Bargara agrees, quote, they want exactly what we want, unquote. And he says his bike will help them make a living and take care of their families. Well, can you imagine all the businesses that could be run from having electricity? For one, if you have anything that sells anything, you were selling it in darkness before, you turn on the lights and now people can come over and buy from you. That opens one door right there. The idea I love most is growing food using LED lights. Because if you bring this plant indoors, it doesn't matter what's going on outdoors. The plant takes up the water and it uses the LED lights in the right frequency to deliver just the right amount of energy at the right wavelength so the plant can make sugars, which means fruits and vegetables. My favorite products are tomatoes and peppers. I believe that both of them can be used by every household in the world every day of every week of every year. And when I look at what we are consuming, 273 pounds of fruits per person, figure out what 10,000 people would require. It's in the millions of pounds. And we're also consuming 415 pounds of vegetables each year. The pepper is a vegetable, but the tomato is a fruit. It's in the berry family. The Supreme Court ruled it a vegetable because they wanted to tax it. That shows you how honest the Supreme Court is. They're not honest. They changed the Constitution in order to fit the fascists. I don't agree with that. I'd like to see them out of business. We don't need a Supreme Court. We have one in every state. That's enough. We don't need one centralized Supreme Court that is corrupt and dishonest. The tomato is a fruit. Study the botany before you make a Supreme Court decision. Taxation is no justification for changing phylogeny. Now, all the businesses that are going to emanate from electricity and light and growing food, 
Bhargava says he wants to give them something useful, not buff his public image. I want publicity for the project, but not for me, Bhargava says, referring to the documentary made by Film 45's Peter Berg, who directed the 2013 war movie Lone Survivor. Quote, there is no purpose in being famous unless you have a hobby like Donald Trump. That's his hobby, unquote. Let's move on because Donald Trump is not part of this. He's a selfish person who only cares about his ego. And we don't want him as president. We want him to just fucking retire. Get the fuck out of here and take your dead cat with you. Bargava also says he doesn't see altruism in his philanthropy. Quote, I like work, unquote, he says. It's not giving back. It's what else am I going to do? We already read that. The story is part of a special series that explores energy issues. For more, visit the Great Energy Challenge. There's probably a link there for that. On Twitter, follow Wendy Koch and get more environment and energy coverage at Nat Geo Energy. That's one word, N-A-T-G-E-O-E-N-E-R-G-Y. There's probably a link for that also. I'll give you the URL in the video description. That's the end of the article. I found it very interesting, and I wanted to read it to you and comment. Now it's your turn to comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. See you next time.